Don't you have luck with women? I never had luck with women. No, ladies, man, I know that, Johnny. I never got girls when I was a kid in show business either, you know? Well, one girl told me, come on over, there's nobody home. I went over, there was nobody home. <laughs> Welcome to DSM series, Black Art Matters. We're here today with Katherine Kirk, who is a Dallas native and graduate of the dance program at Booker T. Washington High School for the Performing and Visual Arts, and is now dancing for Kyle Abraham's company, AIM, in New York City. Welcome, Katherine. Hi. So how are you doing today? Just to clear good. the air first. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> good, a good. good. I don't even know what today is, Wednesday? Uh, Something like that. <laughs> <Or> Thursday. <laughs> they all blend together right they now. They really do. <laughs> um, so we're going to jump right into the questions here that we have for you. So the series itself is called Black Art Matters. Mm -hmm. And so I want to start the conversation just by asking the question, what does black identity mean to you and for you? Mm. Um, it's a doozy. It still is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start off a little heavy today. Yeah. 
Um, I I automatically think like in questions surrounding black identity, whether it is in the performing arts, whether it's personal, communal, like just the reminder that we aren't a monolith, you mm-hmm. know, like we are everything and so much more than everything, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And like to me, my black identity or like my me living in my blackness has definitely been a journey through my life. Grew up here in Dallas, same house that I'm going to be returning to, (laughs) lived there my whole life. And it's a very white neighborhood. And I went to what was then Stonewall Jackson. I'm hoping they changed the name, not sure. Um, And that was a very white experience. So I would definitely kind of grew up more so being the token in like public spaces. Mm -hmm. Although with my family and our family friends, that obviously wasn't the case. And then I went to Griner, Mm -hmm. um, which was on dope. It was very (laughs) interesting, quite the shift, Um, which is like mainly Latinx. And then a little bit of like some white folks, some black folks, and then went to Booker T, which is much more diverse. So I kind of like fluctuated between these spaces, dealt with like my nickname happened to be Oreo, which I wouldn't really know if I'd call it a nickname, more of just like bullies would call me that. More so in middle school and whatnot. And like just dealing with these stereotypes of not feeling or identity crises of like not feeling black enough in black spaces. Mm -hmm. And obviously was made to feel too black for white spaces in some situations. Um, But as I like matured, I feel like in particular post my NYU mm-hmm. I, I went I moved to New York to go to um, New York University which is very white as well it's quite the ivory tower yeah. um once I like entered AIM which although we don't consider ourselves a black dance company it's black run black owned mm-hmm. black dancers was kind of when I started to feel more of a sense of community moved to Brooklyn like just started to be more around my people, people mm-hmm. who looked like me, people who appreciated like my quirkiness and all of the above. Um, and since then, I feel like my shift, like with how I approach my blackness, my presence in whatever space I'm in has just become more confident. Yeah. Um, but it is a reminder. Cause I feel like oftentimes when I am in those spaces where I'm like the token or the only person, like I'm not here to, represent black people Mm -hmm. i'm not here as like the voice of the black community because the black community like we exist but in another way i'm like kind of tired of hearing like i mean i use it myself but (laughs) as well but like in political worlds and whatnot it's like we're just kind of this like boxed in idea um that to me really doesn't exist yeah you know i really uh it sticks with me this idea of you know growing up in these white spaces and having this tokenism attached to you, Mm -hmm. how did growing up in those white spaces and being labeled the token influence your creativity um, Mm. through dance and the choice to go into dance and the work that you chose to do um, from a young age moving forward? Yeah, I don't, I mean, also I think it's something where, it like hindsight's in 2020, Mm -hmm. right? Like when I was in it, I was just in it. Like I knew, I was black. I knew they were white. Like for the most part, folks were of course like tolerant and accepting. Like there wasn't a ton of horrible (laughs) things that were said and done. And it was more so like my presence was tokenized um, as opposed to like them literally labeling me that. Mm -hmm. So in, in the thick of it, like I'm very aware of it. Um, And of course comments are made, whether it's like, oh, I can get a tan or you need sunscreen or your hair doesn't fall back down if I pick it up. And I'm like, why are you picking up my hair? <laughs> um, so, but in my, in dancing, basically also I joined like my neighborhood dance studio just because my friends were there mm-hmm. and like sports seasons were over, much more of like a tomboy, very, and I was very, very into sports. Like I made fun of like ballerinas. <laughs> so I was like, I don't want to do that. But my best friend, Lauren Lozano and Emily Preston, who are still my close friends, um, went to, I think it was called like Cherry Lane Mm -hmm. and it's now called CBD or, well, I think it's now called Contemporary Valley Dallas. Dallas, (laughs) (laughs) I don't think they call it CBD anymore. I'm not sure. But um, I went there 
And I just felt like, well, also I just like found myself continuing as mm-hmm. opposed to me like really identifying and speaking like, wow, I loved dance. I'm going to follow this through. I just like kind of found that I was like never leaving. Mm -hmm. And I still kind of feel that way about (laughs) dance. Like I always say, I'm like, I think dance chose me more than me choosing to dance or choosing to like make it a career. Mm -hmm. I just found myself like never leaving. And it was just super also helpful to have another form of like expression because I didn't, I definitely was not one to (laughs) use my words. And if so, not well. So I think just through the whole experience, I just found a different way to like connect to my identity, connect to my body physically, Mm -hmm. to my emotions inside. It helped me cope. And creatively, I think I also did realize like through some more of like the composition classes, improv, when I got to be free in like my choices, Mm -hmm. I realized and became closer also to my blackness and to those differences and also to how they were perceived by others. So I definitely think it's influenced like that, that freedom and like the confidence that I've grown to have and am consistently (laughs) working on to this day. So when it comes to practicing your art form, um, I would love for you to talk about the differences from your black perspective of practicing that art form here in Dallas versus practicing that art form in New York City Mm. and what that looks like from the Black perspective, specifically your perspective. Mm. I wish I could speak to it more more recently um, because I did, you know, leave after graduating from Booker T in 2010, Mm -hmm. so it was (laughs) 10 years ago, but... At least, again, being at Booker T, it was a really diverse space. But I really, like, I can say, like, they're, they're in, in that way, in, in terms of, like, my Black perspective, there wasn't even really a shift. It was more so mm-hmm. a shift in, like, the literal environment, the literal classes I was right. taking, the level of the classes I was taking, my closeness to different professors. But so much of that still... I could pull and connect and relate to my time in Dallas Mm -hmm. and vice versa to my times um, training and performing um, in New York City. And it's been such a blast to return to Dallas as well and perform here. So to have those like returns to dance and I've come back and taken class at Booker T. And um, I I do still feel like, because even within my black perspective, that's that's my perspective. It's how I move. It's how I take class. Mm -hmm. It's how... I progress through my artistry mm-hmm. and challenge my artistry. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I can't really say there's too much of a shift in that experience, more so just like my experience and my leveling up in literal levels. Yes. And also, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there, but more so just that like training and investment in my artistry as opposed to like technique. Great which I think also came with age with me leaving here at 18 and now being 28. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I think that thanks for sharing that. Um, when it comes to, you know, s- storytelling through dance for you, is there, when you're dancing, let's say for a predominantly white audience versus a predominantly black audience, is there a different story you're attempting to tell through the work that you're doing on stage? So not so much, but there's a very different energy Mm -hmm. that we will feel Um, and sometimes different connections to the work. Um, So in New York City, I dance for Kyle Abraham's company, AIM. I also dance for a woman, Jasmine Hearn, and have freelanced around Bird Johnson, Helen Simino, who Mm -hmm. was originally based in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So I've been in a lot of different spaces where... Sometimes the audience is diverse. Sometimes we go to places that are like infamously like older and white. And then sometimes we'll be in spaces where we'll have a lot more of a black presence. And um, I really think it can depend on the work because sometimes the work can be much more abstract. It Mm -hmm. could be much more narrative, have many more um, ties to like black culture, Mm -hmm. which we're actually um, kind of creating now with AIM is like an evening link for um, set all to D'Angelo mm-hmm. and it's centered around black love. So we've honestly, in that case have had much more diverse audiences, but there is like, you can tell like 
maybe who the laughter is coming from, like mm-hmm. who gets the jokes, um, cause there's text in it and it kind of can reference like eighties black culture. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's definitely a different energy that we feel coming from the audience. Um, Although, you know, I also don't always know in the midst of it, like the audience is blacked out. Right. But there are some works where there are, um, I'm in silhouette, so I can totally see who's in the audience <laughs> as well. But you can feel that that difference in energy, although um, our narrative doesn't like quite literally change, especially if it's the same program. But there's probably some different amount of like freedom maybe that I tap into maybe or but hopefully not because hopefully I'm as free for anyone, but, um, and for myself, but that probably definitely (laughs) exists, you know, when you're more comfortable in certain spaces. And when you get more of that feedback from audiences, you, you have a bit more, um, play and availability to like riff within the work and feel free and, um, maybe more open to the narrative ourselves. Right. So this series lives with an organization whose primary mission is Broadway and musical theater. And that's kind of what our audiences are used to seeing, um, which there's a very heavy dance element mm-hmm. in the musical theater. But coming from a purely dance performance background, um, I'm really curious. And I think our audience would be curious to know what are there racial tensions that you feel in your in your sector that we have felt and continue to see as well in our musical theater sector? And how does that affect the work that you do and um, the life you live uh, creatively? Dude, wouldn't it be so nice if I was like, no, there's (laughs) there's, there's actually (laughs) no racial tension in the entire dance field. Um, Wouldn't that be so nice? I wish. (laughs) Um, But yes, (laughs) Um, there, I've been actually in a lot of conversation that's been super beautiful honestly one of the beautiful things that's come of this pandemic and this like quarantine and everyone being at home and having these groups pop up over zoom and whatnot and Mm -hmm. I've been in a few that um a lot has actually like come up and we've been able to take the time and have like a physical break from dance although I still feel like I'm almost dancing more freely just because I'm like on my own in my room doing what I want (laughs) Um, and creating what I want, but there have been a lot of conversations like from education mm-hmm. to getting in companies to performing on stage to audience fetishization, which is really real. And mm-hmm. we all kind of like have to have those conversations as well. Like we want to be free and perform what we want, but we also need to be aware of different audiences motives and like those different spaces and, and how that can exist for us although we don't have intense contact with the audience it's still felt right um so pertaining to education like a huge problem is that only eurocentric you know techniques are uplifted Mm -hmm. and there's this whole idea that like ballet is the foundation Mm -hmm. right and and if that's not in your background I feel like it just adds a different like tone or maybe you're not taken as seriously or you're put in a different box. And it's not often that you see like lots of different cultural and world dances presented on stage Mm -hmm. in, in a concert setting. Like we call it concert dance, although it's, it sounds like commercial dance because you would think like, Oh, Janet Jackson concert. We're like, no, like at the Moody (laughs) performance theater. Um, So we've talked a lot about that and even the ways that like black body is quite, physically develop different Mm -hmm. and um the adultification that can happen especially to young black girls in those spaces and not literally fitting into the ballet body which Mm -hmm. is white flat you know very (laughs) small and we have curves and develop in different ways and you'll have teachers literally trying to like tuck your pelvis under to hide your butt or you're made to feel like you're doing something wrong because you're not taking those um bad alignment cues you know Mm -hmm. so people talked about injuries in those ways and a whole bunch of different things but really kind of a lot of the conversation has been around needing more transparency and more collaboration and conversation especially in um educational like spaces and academia of dance um and how like eurocentric techniques choreographers are really uplifted and um, 
it can be like pretty <laughs> toxic. Like even as I think about it, I'm like, oh my God, that's yeah. so true. Like you're, I was myself like made to feel like worse technically because I didn't have and didn't really love ballet. Right. Um, it was always like, okay, you can come, but like you're really weak in ballet and everyone else is this. So you're going to be here in this bottom level. And I'm like, all right, but I still, <laughs> I luckily still carried through and it didn't totally knock me down. Um, but it does for so many other people. And then even just like resources and how expensive it can be to like be a dancer, to grow up, to go to the studio, buy costumes, mm -hmm. pay these fees, do that. So like even accessibility. So the conversation has gone <laughs> on and on and yeah. on when it comes to auditioning. A lot of people will use the excuse like, oh, black people aren't showing up. So we don't mm. have any. I'm like, oh, you sure? Yeah, like, right. <laughs> yeah, like, you know. You want to rethink that? Statement? Yeah. And then also having conversations like we want to make sure that we're not the diversity check, you know, right. that you're not. And if you are like are, how are you <laughs> like, yeah. how is your mental how are you being mm -hmm. treated um and then even in black institutions as some has come to light as well like you know we've all learned a lot from our oppressors mm -hmm. and just because it's a black institution just because it's a black owned company doesn't also mean that it's like the safest place to go the most transparent place to go the most financially supportive place to go so I could go on and on. Oh, thank you for sh that's sharing all of that. That's yeah. that's wonderful information, especially for our, I think our audiences to yeah. know and realize yeah. um, who kind of live in this different space of mm -hmm. Broadway rather than purely dance based. Um, but I want to piggyback off a lot of what you said when it comes to having a support system in place, because you grew up in a pretty socially active family. Your father being the first black mayor of Dallas and the U.S. trade rep under Obama. Your mom being an incredible powerhouse, not only in the business community, but also in the philanthropic community here in Dallas. Mm -hmm. So what support systems did you have in place both growing up personally and then what support systems do you have now professionally? And do you think it's enough both for you, but also just for the entire black community? Is there enough support in place to make sure that we're taken care of mentally, emotionally uh, and physically? Mm. Yeah, I feel like. Personally, I had the best support system. My grandma, my um, my paternal grandma, my dad's mom was also a civil rights activist. I think my grandma, my grandfather too, was too, but I, I never met either of those. My grandfathers, so they passed before I was born. And she, I was really, really close to my, my granny Kirk. <laughs> um, and she was amazing and super supportive. And um, within my upbringing, it was lovely because I think although... I found I definitely put pressure on myself or can be self-conscious in spaces where like I am the only artist like my dad is you know lawyer politician mm -hmm. my mom's an executive search consultant philanthropic works in the arts but not an artist my sister <clears throat> went to an Ivy League she went to Columbia University um, studied art history and then recently graduated from Fordham Law so sometimes I can be like, okay, like I know I'm doing well, at least yeah. in my dance career. Um, but they were always like, do what you love. Like, at least, you know right. what you love to do. That's huge. A lot of people don't walk through life even having an understanding of their passion or a full grasp on it, let alone have like admitted it and fought for it. And mm -hmm. I did that. So they were actually always very supportive and just reiterated that doing what you love is most important um which I probably did need more I think it's definitely like shaped who I mm -hmm. am because I've also feel like I've never really thought differently although I've been self-conscious around other spaces where it's like I'm broke <laughs> you guys are doing so well <laughs> um but they were always totally supportive and now my support system definitely is in New York City. I have a really tight group of friends. Right. Um, a lot actually have come out of me doing, being in AIM for seven years and having, uh, meeting some other dancers that I wouldn't have gotten to know and touring with them. And some of them are like, all of them are like my family now. Mm -hmm. And we talk quite a bit and, um, Again, even through this time, it's kind of funny. I was talking to my boyfriend about it last night. I was like, a lot of the people that I feel closest to right now, aside from my tight group, like I've actually never met them. Like we all like met over Zoom and like stayed in these conversations around dance, but have also made personal connections, connected over Instagram, taken it off on the side. And I'm like, I see these people like 
at least once a week in some way now. And I'm like, I actually never met you in person. And I technically don't even know if you live in New York. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's been, I feel like for me, I, I feel like I have an amazing support system. Um, and it, I believe it will continue well beyond my performing career. I don't think there's enough support um, as a whole within the black community and um, maybe like honed in a little bit more on like black performing artists. Mm -hmm. Again, I think it's like in terms of like, con you know, constant and existing white supremacist structures, like there's a hoarding of power mm -hmm. and a hoarding of resources. And um, <clears throat> it's also deliberate and, you know, there's, it's not like just a coincidence that our people are ones like living in food deserts right. and being like redlined and block busted and they're not in well-funded schools, mm -hmm. which is like the basic, <laughs> you know, like it's literal what, like school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. Like we see all of these things. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we definitely need so much more support and also within the black the black community, if I am to go there, I do think there are more challenges that really need to be fleshed out. You know, again, it goes back to like, what have we learned from our oppressors that we need mm -hmm. to unlearn? Um, I think homophobia, transphobia, like totally exists. I think that um, that could also have this like disgusting parallel to like a man or a a mask identifying like person who wants to dance is immediately perceived to be gay. And mm -hmm. if you are, so what? Like, I just feel like we have so many things to work on yeah. um, within our own community while we're still talking about the support that's needed on a much larger level. Um, and again, like, <clears throat> unfortunately it's expensive. Like <laughs> it, it, I feel like to even like be a dancer shows that you've either that you've had some type of um, support from your family or scholarships, mm -hmm. like training is expensive in many cases. And there are amazing places that are free and, or are, you know, more accessible to black communities, but that's not something that is like consistent throughout. Right. So, and I think that probably most likely reaches into the musical theater world mm -hmm. and into all For performing sure. arts mm -hmm. and visual art. Um, and into every into every <laughs> walk of life um so yeah and and also like um students access like young black people's access mm -hmm. to being in the theater yes. and to being in museums in galleries mm -hmm. like wherever um is hugely important and i think it's great to see that a lot of theaters have these programs, have busing programs, can reach out to communities and make sure that they give them free tickets. But at the same point, it's kind of disheartening to feel like at least being on tour and have me being, I've been on tour for the past six years because mm -hmm. we revved up our touring a lot more like my first full year into the company. And I don't want to feel like the only reason why there might be a more present black audience is because of some kind of external program that right. like brings people in for busing. Like it's great that it exists, but I think in terms of even venues and <clears throat> foundations planning moving forward, it's like, how do you support that, but also push that support even further so that maybe one day it's not as needed. Like right. maybe you can cultivate some types of programs that are more sustainable and follow through with those people mm -hmm. to make sure that they're doing well and they're, getting their education, they're graduating, they're getting work and um, they're able to return on their own one day as opposed yeah. to always needing those resources. Yeah. So we've got a long ways to go. There's yeah. a lot of support needed. <laughs> I wish we had three hours to talk about all this, Catherine, because it's, the perspective you bring is so incredible. Um, I wanna wrap us up here with one final question that I have for you. And that is what advice, if any, would you give to younger black children who want to follow in your footsteps mm. and be dancers what advice do you have for them as they go through what you likely have had gone through um, in your experience 
I would say for folks who want to dance, even who want to sing, like those things to me are always with you. Like if you feel that urge, mm -hmm. you can ignite it, you know, like in your bedroom or in your living room. Trust me, I was dancing. I was the star of Tom <laughs> Thumb growing up, like always dancing in Albertsons or any grocery store you could find me in and just never stop moving in that way. And I think it's hard for kids because we're not taught to like stand our ground and like, mom, dad, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And like how, and if you can't afford it, how can we apply for a scholarship or this foundation? And it's like, unfortunately, in a lot of the performing arts world, there is a big like distance from it. And sometimes it can feel like you don't know where to begin. Yeah. You don't know what foundations, scholarships, programs can even, or even exist to, to help you get started. Mm -hmm. So some of the conversation that we've also been having within <clears throat> some of the black dance groups that I've been in is like, how do we reach out to like parents even yeah. like, how do you, even within these programs, make sure that maybe you're not just busing in kids from school, but maybe from neighborhoods so their parents can come with them mm -hmm. and see like, this is something that could exist for my child. And even if it's not, it's still worth investing in. Cause I think oftentimes if a kid wants to dance and they express that, and I understand a parent's like, oh my God, like you're going to be broke. Like, how, do you really think you're going to have a career in this? Like, what if we had those, that support and the means to say, even if you don't want a career in this, even if there are roadblocks along the way, it's still something that can nourish <clears throat> any, excuse me, <clears throat> anything else that you're going to move forward and do in life. Yeah. Like, even for me, like I've danced, I've still went to NYU, got an amazing education, learned amazing information from amazing professors. I'm also the marketing and education associate for the company I work in. I think dancers just make like some of the best employees in general <laughs> after a performing career. And I've heard the same from other people. So, and the arts in general, like even again, if you're going to move it into engineering or coding or politics or mm -hmm. government, like I think it just helps ground you. It helps you grow to be creative. Any performing arts industry, I feel, helps you grow to be more disciplined, yes. you know, so. The skills are so transferable. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes it's like, I want to tell the kids, like, just keep going. Like, it's in you, you know. And, and when you don't feel like you want to keep going, take a pause. It might come back to you, you know. Like, there's not this, there shouldn't be this, like, crazy pressure to the point that it just becomes about to be about like training instead of artistry. Mm -hmm. So that's for the youth. But I also would like definitely want to express to those parents, guardians, mentors, like to come to the theater if you can mm -hmm. and to do that type of research and to understand that while it might take time, I think it's an, a beautiful investment that I would love to see more black children, more children in general, like invested in the performing arts or the visual arts or just the arts. Like yeah. it's such an amazing space to exist in and to witness and to behold. That was so beautifully said, Catherine. And thank you. thank you for sharing your time with us today, sharing your experiences with us today. I've learned a lot. <laughs> I hope those watching have also learned a lot. And we just thank you and are so grateful for you being here and can't wait to see you yes. on stage again very, very, know, very soon. Titus. <laughs> We're supposed to be coming back in March. So, so fingers crossed. Fingers and, crossed, um, yeah. Again, thank you for being here today. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.